Hello and welcome to Channels Book Club. My name is Olakunle Kasumo and it's great to be on the show again. This is the season of politics as the country heads into the 2023 general elections. It's a season where you hear all sorts of things, negotiations, horse trading, betrayals, and uh, it, all, all manner of things we hear at this, at this point in time from our politicians. But it's an exciting period, as serious as it is. But Nigeria's story is a story that is intriguing. It has always been intriguing since the colonial era, since the British negotiated, or some will say, captured this land that we call Nigeria way back then. And of course, the politicians who were there when the country was fighting for independence and the country eventually became independent, how they had to deal with one another, considering the fact that the country had been well, more or less divided into North and South. The Northern and the Southern Protectorate came together in 1914. And since then, there has been that politics going on between the two regions. Even up until now, no matter how much some people don't like to admit it. Now, all this and more are in the book we are featuring today, Becoming President of Nigeria, a Citizen's Guide. Well, this book is not about step one, how to be president of Nigeria, step one, this, step two, that, step three, that, step four, that, no. It's a very captivating book which talks about the story of the making of Nigeria and the dynamics that make up this country, religion, multi-ethnicity, and the likes that come together to make up Nigeria and how all these dynamics influence politics in Nigeria. It's a book you have to read, written by Magnus Onyibe. He's our guest today, and he talks a lot more about the book. You'll learn more from him about the book than from whatever I tell you about it. Please stay tuned. Magnus Oyibe is a public policy analyst, media columnist, and author. Oyibe was a broadcaster with Nigeria Television Authority and a two-time commissioner in Delta State. He is the founder of Inspire Group, which comprises of Inspire Realtors Limited, Inspire Media Services Limited, Inspire Consulting Limited, and Inspire Auto Service Limited. He is a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Management, Institute of Credit Administration, Institute of Strategic Management, and Institute of Information Management of Nigeria. Oyebe joins Channel's Book Club to discuss his latest book, Becoming President of Nigeria, A Citizen's Guide. Magnus Onyibe. Did I pronounce your surname word? Onyibe. Onyibe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you on Channels Book Club. Thank you. Great to have you here. Mm -hmm. Once again. Mm. <laughs> now, um, um, it, it, it's been a while, and um, you've written this book, Becoming President of Nigeria, A Citizen's Guide. There's so much to talk about in this book. But for viewers who are watching, mm -hmm. what's your book about? The book is about rekindling hope in Nigeria that we are operating a democracy. It's not an aristocracy. It's not a monarchy. That every Nigerian, no matter their station in life, can become president of Nigeria, irrespective of the incongruities in the system right now, whereby people are beginning to think it's not government of the people, for the people, and by the people. You know, they are beginning to think it's government of the rich, because if you take into consideration the huge amount of money that an individual is supposed to pay to obtain nomination form, ticket 100 million for the APC and 40 million for the PDP, people would think that that kind of money is not within the range of regular Nigerians. But that just happened now, and it wasn't there before I wrote this book. But nevertheless, um, there's still hope that anybody, any Nigerian that is of age, 35 years, that went to school up to school certificate. Mark you, it doesn't have to have school certificate, first school living certificate, doesn't have to have it. 
you know, from, if you look at it, the nitty gritty of it, can become president of Nigeria. And indeed, of the five people that have been presidents in Nigeria, three of them have been school teachers. And if, if you remember what people used to say, that the reward for teachers is in heaven. Mm -hmm. The reward is here on earth, <laughs> from Alaji Shewu Shagari to uh, Umar Musaya yeah, Adwa, and, and they do good, good luck, Jonathan. Jonathan. They were all teachers. The, the other two have been soldiers. And you know what they used to say as, as well about bloody civilians and bloody soldiers, mm -hmm. whatever, you know. So, um, Olushe Gwon Basanjo, General Olushe Gwon Basanjo, who became president in 1999, and PMB, President uh, Muhammadu Buhari, who was head of state a long time ago, is also another one. So, there's hope that anybody who aspires to be a Nigerian can become president in Nigeria. And that's what I'm trying to uh, rekindle. Mm. So your book is a guide to people like me, everybody out there, for anybody who wants to become president or who wants to understand mm -hmm. the process and requirements of becoming president in Nigeria. You're right. Uh, and it's not as simple as, um, oh, step one, by form, step two. Absolutely. Because in this book, you've gone into history. Absolutely. To understand the dynamics, the complexities mm -hmm. that make up Nigeria, mm -hmm. and to put a presidential candidate mm -hmm. within that context. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Absolutely. What we I did here, in fact, if... Uh, <laughs> There's a piece in uh, one of the chapters that says, if you want to become president of Nigeria, be like Chief M.K. Abiola of blessed memory. The reason is that M.K. Abiola was a people's man. He built up that uh, court followership over time through philanthropy. He was a pillar of sports in Nigeria. He owned um, newspapers. a newspaper house. He had uh, businesses. He had businesses here and there. He was a Muslim, but he reached out to Christians. M.K. Abiola would uh, attend your event in Karanamuda and in Enugu and in Ibadan or Bomosho anytime, any day. So he reached out. So he built a court followership. That's why um, he was well accepted and uh, he was able to even beat Daraki Tufa, his challenger in Kano. Two files was from Kano, you know, so he mm -hmm. beat him in the election there. And that's also one of the reasons why that 1993 election is adjudged to have been one of the freest and, yeah, okay. and, and, and uh, fairest in Nigeria. Mm. Interesting. Now, uh, le le let's get to the core of your book. Um, it seems to me that something you wrote on page Roman numerals um, 22. Mm. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. if this is the core yeah. of your book. Um, unfortunately, it has become obvious that identity politics has become the rule rather than the exception in Nigerian political space. And it is, without doubt, the scourge hindering Nigeria's progress and development. Therefore, a major malaise. It may be recalled that a plethora of measures have been introduced towards achieving ethnic harmony and pursuit of nationhood. Absolutely. It, it, looks like, it looks like, as far as you are concerned, that multi-ethnic, multi-religious nature of Nigeria and our inability to handle that complexity is the bane of our problem. That's absolutely correct. That's the bane of our problems. Nigeria is not the only country on earth that is multi-ethnic. As I also noted in the book, the UK is, it has the English, the Welsh, the Scottish, and the Irish. But one way or the other, they organize themselves and they move forward because they are operating parliamentary system. They're operating a system that works for them. And that's the system that they bequeathed to us. But after the coup, 1966 coup, and the counter coup and the war, and in 1979, we introduced well, we returned to democracy. We started this presidential system of government that's very expensive and that doesn't uh, create a forum for us to be able to discuss issues as regularly as we should. If you remember, before 1966, there were constitutional conferences that were held. They were held in Ibadan, held in Kano, held in Enugu, and you know, they worked out their differences. It's 
side, the three regions, you know, when they had issues, they went there, they tabled it and whatever. And these things were resolved. But unfortunately, that kind of platform is not there anymore. The National Assembly that we have here is populated by people who are so interested in identity politics. And as I uh, try to state further, the conclusion of this book is about identity politics, you know, as well. And I talked about the myth of thinking that if somebody that's the president of Nigeria comes from your zone, that you are going to benefit in any special way. That has never, it, have, it, it really doesn't happen, you know, as such. The people in Casina, where the president comes from, are not so well off. They are faced with a lot of terrorism issues right now, and that they go on the street every day to protest, whatever, you know. And um, I don't see any big difference that came from Obasanjo being the president of Nigeria, because the people in Ota still don't have road from Lagos to there, up to now, you know. So there's no, nothing spectacular that happened in Ota or in Abeokuta for that reason. So the it's a myth. Thing, yeah, so it's a myth. The same thing with Vice, Vice President Yemi Ushibanjo. There's no big deal in the place where he comes from. In fact, the only institution, major institution in that place was founded by somebody who wasn't a politician, Tai Sholari. You know, so he, he founded the school there, whatever. So Yemi Ushibanjo was probably a kid when he founded the school. And he's been president, vice president for seven years. What has he done there? So it, it's not you know, that. So it, why has that been? I mean, you've written a lot. I don't, I, honestly speaking, I don't even know where to start from. I mean, mm. from everything you've written here, because mm. it's a combination of history and um, contemporary times. You, you try to juxtapose both. You know, yes. a lot, yeah. Mm. Mm. But let's 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 hit the nail on the head. Let's let's put things down mm. plainly. The issue of Nigeria from the beginning being divided into north and south, mm. which you explained here, chapter mm -hmm. one. Trade as a unifying factor for cooperation between northern and southern Nigeria yeah. and all that. Over the years after, that dichotomy has affected our politics. Correct. Uh, and you explained how in the Fourth Republic that became an issue in terms of rotating power mm -hmm. from north to south. Mm -hmm. And how in 2023, it doesn't look like we are heading in that direction. Mm -hmm. Can you please explain this you know, um, as you have written in your book, mm. how this affects our politics mm. and how it will probably affect our destiny as far as 2023 is concerned. Yes, it's a very dangerous um, development. 2023, it's, um, the, what, what the problem is right now, it's like I stated in my last article, is that the two major political parties are shadowing each other, whether we like it or not. The, it's from the two major political parties, APC, the ruling party, and PDP, that the president of Nigeria in 2023 will emerge. Forget independent candidate. That doesn't happen in our constitution for now. The fringe parties cannot produce a president because they don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the structure to be able to do that. And now, all of a sudden, there's some kind of fear, you know, by one political party over the other that should a political party produce a candidate from the north and the second doesn't do that, that the political party that doesn't bring a candidate from the north will lose election. And that's based on some belief that the north has the biggest vote, um, a block for voting. Voting block. Yes. Yeah. And that uh, the north is monolithic. And that, you know, so if they are not voting for their kid and cane, who is on the ballot. They are not going to vote for anybody else. Yeah. So, which is why both parties now are struggling to bring their kid and cane to be on the ballot. Mm. So that's a challenge. Mm. And if that happens, it means it vitiates everything that our phobias have done because they know about the risks that we face with ethnic dominance and all that and all that. Yeah. That's why they created the Federal, Federal Character Commission. Mm. That's why they also did the rotation thing in 1994, 1995. Because they want the fear to be allayed. The fear of the minority that the majority will dominate to be allayed. So that's why they want it to circulate. Mm. But unfortunately, it's in the north right now. And if it does not return to the south, 
this whole fear will be heightened. What we've been dealing with in the past six, seven years would get worse mm. because they will be agitated. Nobody wants to be enslaved. Nobody wants to be uh, discountenanced. And they are, they've been working based on the experience that they have. But it has not always been so. So, you, you, you know, it's not likely that, you know, what is happening now that people are complaining against would continue from 2023, even if the president comes from the north. Mm -hmm. But there's experience. The current experience is what is driving the yeah. fear right now. now. And uh, we face that kind of risk that you just uh, talked about. Hmm. So it seems like um, you are fully behind the idea of power rotation. Power rotation is For actually... For a country like ours. No, if you look at this book, actually, you know, if you look, go, go to the back blob, power rotation is actually not the best. It, says, it, it leads to zero-sum politics. Winner takes it all. When the Yorubas are there, let's take, for instance, OBJ. He built a castle, so to speak, of people of his ethnic group around him and stuff like that and whatever. Not to the extent that it is right now. Which you wrote in your book, Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Because actually, it's not his people of his ethnic group that put him there. You know, the Nigerians, you know, that put OBJ there. If the Yorubas didn't want him, if, you know, but yet he built his whatever. So now, the houses have come. No, OK, fine. After him, the houses were to come. But uh, Lechia Radua passed away, and Jonathan came. So Jonathan built a castle of his people, whatever, and everything. In 2015, he was kicked out. So his castle came back all the way to Grand Zero. And now PMB is there, and he's building his own. If the thing goes to the north, uh, to the east, the easterner will come and bring it to Grand Zero and begin to build its own. So it becomes zero-sum politics when it should be multi-sum politics. So we are not going to grow because our growth is not incremental. We're bringing it down to zero and begin to build again when we should be building on top. Well, this is where we have to stop. Um, yeah, we don't want to let people read the whole book right here, do we? Absolutely. No, no. <laughs> you know, but incidentally, a lot of people are very curious. It's been, they're buying it off the shelf, because some people think, you know, as you said, that it was like a manual. Like, uh, if you want to be president <laughs> of Nigeria, eat a bar in the morning, yes. eat a goose in the evening, <laughs> and drink tea in the, in, in the afternoon, something yeah. like that. You know? But no, as you said, it has a lot of history. Yeah. You know, so it, uh, uh, just to put this in perspective, perspective, and it's my way of giving back to society, really. Well done. Yeah. You've thank done you. well. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for, thank you. for writing this, and thank you for joining us on Channel's Book Club. Anytime. I, I, I love coming to Channel's Book Club, and I watch you a lot. Thank you very much, sir. Oh. Well, you can only fully grasp the book when you read it. Highly recommended. It's a book you need to pick up and read. And like I said at the beginning, this is a political season. All the politicians in Nigeria who are involved in politicking right now, who want to continue to lead the country or throw their hats in the ring to lead the country, either at the national or state level, need to read this book by Magnus Oyibe. Up next is a reading by a fascinating young writer who has written a fascinating book. Enjoy this. Hello, my name is Osundulire Oladakbo Ifelanwa. I'm an architect and a writer and a winner of the Innovation 360 degree competition by the British Council. Um, I'm also the author of Black White, from which I'll be reading portions of it today. I will start with the prologue. There's a tree in Ondo town from which the corpses of dogs hang in various stages of decay. This tree grows on a mound enclosed by a wall covered with ritual objects and the decades-old congealed blood of sacrificial beasts. Their hind legs are held in place by ropes and their eyeless skulls peer soullessly to the ground just inches above the blood-blackened earth. It is a reminder of the annual festival in honor of Ogun, the god of iron. I grew up in this place 
and attended these festivals with my childhood friends. I walked great distances from our flat on Okeayo Street to the very ends of this Asian town, to the old Anglican church where I spent a great deal of time learning religion, finding my gifts and making friends, to old secondary schools where I attended extramural classes with Ghanaian teachers, and the many aimless wanderings I engaged in across backyards, through markets, in between streets, down earth roads, and often through the corridors of Face Me, I Face You houses that doubled as public thoroughfare. This is the prologue or the start of the prologue for Black White, and it sort of captures um, in as much detail as I can the Ondo town that I grew up in. And that's really, that's the start of the story. The first chapter of Black White is titled Lagos. And it's my experience coming to Lagos as a young professional. And that would be where I would find the opportunity um, to win the competition I'd mentioned earlier. So every chapter in Black White is named after the city or the place where it happens. And there's a chapter called London. I'll read just a few um, pieces from that chapter, London. First time students over here, please. And the airport officials directed us to the many queues that led to the immigration gates. When it was my turn, the immigration officer checked all my documents and told me to go. I didn't move immediately. It all seemed too easy. She hadn't searched me or asked questions. Still unsure, I walked up to a cluster of smartly dressed policemen who stood to the side of the passing crowd that had made it past immigration. Watching us stream past, I asked one of them if I needed to be searched. You want me to search you, he responded, a little taken aback. No, no, I just wondered. Can I get my bags? Yes, of course. I said a quick thank you and walked away as fast as I could. I looked back to see the policeman laughing, policeman laughing with his colleagues. I joined the throng of people and we all walked on in lemon-like procession until we arrived at the baggage claim section where I waited briefly, collected my luggage from the conveyor belt and wheeled it to the main waiting area. I observed that there wasn't an obvious presence of military personnel. It was mostly travelers and airport officials milling past what happened to be idle policemen dressed in uniforms in groups of twos. Barely six hours ago in my home country, a soldier at the airport had told me, who are you? Do you think you are the president? If you are not careful, I will not let you travel. All because I had filled the immigration cards with red ink. And this will be the start of a lot of cultural shifts for me, um, attending school, um, working, and doing, you know, just trying to be my best in that. So as I round up, I will, I will probably read um, one more um, portion of Black White. Um, just to give you an idea what being there felt like aside with schoolwork. And it's a subtitle, sub, sub chapter um, titled Loneliness. In another man's land, loneliness is often your worst enemy. There are two kinds. One that arises from not seeing other people because you just don't have a place to go. The other, the worst kind, is the one you feel when you are in a crowd and you realize that you have no connection with that crowd. Loneliness was one of the things I had to deal with and Black White is full of all of my experiences as it was happening in real time. And I, I, the, the objective for writing this book is to inspire people and most importantly to be in my head as things unfolded. Um, being Nigerian, being in a different place, and being opportunity, being opportuned or having the privilege um, that I had to eventually see my dream come into reality. 
And I ended the book um, by contemplating whether I would return to Nigeria or not. Um, that decision you probably, readers would find out by themselves. Um, and in all, I have not had regrets um, taking the decisions I did. And I hope that sharing that story with the world um, would inspire someone like me who didn't have the opportunity um, to become something but kept on at it until that became their reality. So thank you for listening. Um, yeah, Black White by Osundulire Ifelawa. Thank you. And this is where we have to end the show today. As always, we're very delighted to get your feedback through any of our social media platforms displayed on your screen. My name is Ola Kunle Kasumo. Remember, one great book can change your life. Bye-bye.